I'm um, good. Where do you want me? Uh, kind right of where you are. Around. Around. Kind of give you know, I kind of like to wander yeah. around. Uh, all right, everybody, once again, uh, and for people tuning in after the fact, we are joined today by Alex Riley. He, like our other visitors, serves in the Missouri House of Representatives. Missouri has its own Congress, which we call the General Assembly. It, too, is bicameral. It has its own Senate, and it has its own uh, House of Representatives. So we're going to give uh, uh, Alex Riley an opportunity to uh, talk about his district. He represents 134. Talk about himself. Talk about the job and then we'll start having a conversation. Sir, whenever you're comfortable. Okay, well, thanks everybody for having me. It's always good to be back, and thank you, Mr. Crocker, for the invitation. I always enjoy that, too. I'm Alex Riley. I'm the state rep from the 134th District, which covers generally southwest Springfield and the city of Battlefield, that sort of neck of the woods. Um, I have been there for three years now, so first elected in 2020, re-elected last November. Um, born and raised in Springfield, lived here my whole life other than a short time away for law school when I went to Southern Illinois University. They bribed me with enough money to go across the river and uh, earn my law degree over there, so did that and then came back and have been practicing uh, law in Springfield since then. Um, do kind of a, a broad spectrum of things in the law, but I mostly do a lot of work with local businesses and um, and then just some sort of general practice stuff. So if you have just, you know, somebody that has some kind of problem, you know, a traffic ticket or whatever, I'll do some of that. Don't really do any criminal stuff other than like the occasional traffic ticket when my dad drives a little too fast through the city of Quentin. If any of you know driven through Quentin, you know it's basically just a big speed trap and they'll get you. So I've done some work there. Um, been married for almost nine years and I've got three little kids. I've got a little boy who just turned four a week ago, a two-year-old girl, and a six-month-old. Today he's six months old officially. So um, we've got a, uh, got a lot of commotion and activity at the house in addition to all the legal responsibilities and legislator responsibility. So as you probably know, our Missouri legislative session starts in January and runs through the middle of May. It's pretty cool because we have a part-time legislature, which I think is a great idea because that means you don't have anyone who's just parked themselves up in Jeff City forever um, and, and they get out of tune with what the, what the people back home want, which I, th which I think is one of the things that sorts of, sort of sets us apart from what happens at the federal level where you have people who just kind of go there and stay there and they forget what, where they came from and what the folks back home want. So we're right in the middle of it, in the thick of it, and we can uh, talk a little bit about what's been going on. I'm sure you all have some good questions about where things are uh, in the legislative session. So you asked me to answer a few questions that I think we talk about every time, which are why I ran, things of that nature. So we'll jump into that next. Um, I've been involved in politics uh, here in Springfield since I was about 12 years old. Um, knocking doors, being involved in the process. So I first got really involved the election right after uh, September 11th. So I was 11 or 12 at the time, wanted to do something um, to try and make an impact on, on the country, try and do something helpful, serve in some sort of way. But as, an, you know, as a 12 year old, there's not a whole lot you can do. So um, for some reason, I, I got really interested in a U.S. Senate race that we had going on at the time, convinced my parents, I don't know how, to let me start knocking doors for this candidate who is running for U.S. Senate. I don't know what my parents were thinking, letting a 12-year-old knock doors, uh, yeah. but, they, but they did. Um, my parents were not political activists by any stretch also. Uh, you know, they voted, but that was about it. Uh, but anyway, I was able to convince them that I wanted to try and be a part of something and, and do something to make an impact. So um, started getting involved in campaigns and basically worked various campaigns around Springfield area every election cycle after that. So have always been really involved in um, the process, very interested in politics, but more important, the policy making side. I think the politics are kind of the necessary evil that you have to get through to actually start doing the policy work and trying to really make an impact. 
on people's lives, and I'll talk about some of my interests on that here in just a second and what I like to focus on. Um, so, hop forward a few years, I'm back in Springfield practicing as an attorney, and like I mentioned, a lot of the work that I do is with our local businesses or people who are wanting to try and start a business or, or you know, do something to provide for their families. And one of the things that always really frustrated me is the fact that so many people felt that they had to come to an attorney to try and have to try and receive help navigating all the burdens that government frequently puts in, in their way and that they have to pay attorneys like me attorney wages to navigate all the codes when really all they're trying to do is open up a business take care of their families live their american dream in whatever capacity that looks like so um when when the opportunity arose i started thinking about running for office and um, started receiving some calls from people who thought it might be a good idea for me to do that so i jumped in and, uh, and won my first election back in 2020 like i mentioned so some of the things that I'm most passionate about and focus on are things relating to economic issues. So as, as you all know, with being in Springfield, we have a lot of opportunity here, but we also have a lot of real challenges. And I've seen those grow over my lifetime here in Springfield to the point where you know now we have almost a 25% poverty rate. We have crime rates that are not where we want them to be. I mean, you look at any sort of statistics and, and Springfield is typically on the on the wrong side of those when you're looking at issues of crime or domestic violence or drug abuse or things like that um, homelessness also so what I've wanted to do in my time in the legislature is more focus on those types of kitchen table issues not so much the, uh, the the cultural war type of things but the things that like really impact people's day-to-day -day lives and I've been frustrated with both parties to be honest and I haven't been shy about criticizing my own party and the other for their approach to um, issues of poverty and homelessness and things of that nature um, I think Republicans have historically just done a really terrible job of how they think about the issue, how they talk about it, and, um, and how they frame policy discussions around those issues. And I think Democrats do a bad job. They do a better job of talking about it, but I, I, their solutions haven't worked. I don't like the approach of just throwing more money at the problem. I want to focus uh, more intentionally on working with, with each individual, finding out what their needs are, and helping them put the, put them on the path to success, whatever success looks like to them. So that's been my approach in the time in the legislature so far, and I've tried to do that in a couple of ways. Um, one, through my work on the budget. I'm, in my first two years, I served on the House Budget Committee. I'm not on the Budget Committee this year, but I still um, have been pretty involved in the, the budget process, and specifically trying to do things to help some of our really good organizations that we have in Springfield that are working with poverty, uh, working in that poverty reduction space and that homelessness space. Um, and also working with um, some, some of our groups uh, that have a lot of work in, in the disabilities arena. So I've, I've focused on trying to provide, ensure Missouri or Springfield is receiving um, some good funding for some of our really good nonprofits here in Springfield that have a great track record of, of, um, of, of helping people that are in tough economic situations who want to get out and just don't know how, find ways and opportunities to get out. So uh, the Drew Lewis Foundation, if any of you are familiar with that amazing group here in Springfield, done a lot of work with them. Um, last year, one of the things that I was able to put in the budget was a $5 million line item for uh, for Ark of the Ozarks here in town to open some um, some autism, some early autism diagnosis centers. So that's something that we don't really have much of that here in Springfield. So if you have especially young kids who um, are, are being examined for that, a lot of times they have to go to Columbia or St. Louis or Kansas City uh, to receive some of those early autism services. 
So able to get some uh, some money in the budget last year to help uh, people be able to stay in Springfield and receive that kind of treatment. And then one of the things that I'm working on this year is um, we have one of our largest homeless shelters in Springfield. Their facility is, is, is literally falling apart right now. Um, and they're, it's an amazing organization with a great track record of success of helping people who you know they're homeless, they, but they they don't want to be, and they want um, they they want to see what opportunities they have for them. Um, they've got a great track record of helping people through that, and then you know find their way into homes and jobs and things like that. Um, so working this year to put some some funding in the budget to make sure that they're able to stay here in Springfield doing the good work that they do. And then um, one of the things that I'm working on this year with some of the legislation I filed is dealing with something called the cliff effect when it comes to benefits. I don't know if you've talked about this in class, uh, but it's, it's, it's a theory, and, and not really a theory, there's, there's a lot of factual backing behind it, that the way we have our, our, social, our, our social programming set up is you know once you reach a penny more than the um, than the amount you're, you're, you know, you, so let me back up. You, you know, you have, when you're, you have a cap on the amount of money you're able to make before you just get kicked off of, of your social safety net benefits, your food stamps, and things of that nature. So what we're seeing and what the data shows is that you have people who, they're working, they want to continue to move their way up the income ladder, but because of the way we have that structured, if they were to if they were to accept a raise, you know, let's say you, you get a raise that's a dollar or two more an hour, then they would automatically be kicked off their benefits, and that uh, has a has a it disincentivizes people to accept those raises because the economics don't make sense. You know, you may make an extra thousand dollars over the course of the year, but you lose. $10,000 worth of benefits. So rather than just kicking people off cold turkey, because what we're seeing is people are just not taking those raises and then they stay trapped in poverty forever because they're not starting to work their way up the income ladder, uh, is to just level that off where they the, the, the amount of benefits starts to decrease proportional to the amount of their income increase. So rather than cutting them off cold turkey and disincentivizing them from taking that that, that uh, raise, you kind of wean them off the benefits over time. So we've had a number of states that have done that successfully. And the nice thing about that is, you know, a lot of welfare type reforms are, are very partisan. You have Republicans doing one thing, you have Democrats doing one thing, and this is one of those areas of reform that all sides tend to agree, you know, there, there's of course exceptions, but there's a general acceptance here in Missouri that that's that that would be a successful approach that both Democrats and Republicans agree to. So that's been a big thing that I've been working on this session. Um, we had the debate on the floor last on the House floor last week, and we may have the final vote to pass it out of the House this week and send it over to the Senate. I've been talking for a while, so I may just pause there and open it up for questions and. Uh, We'll go from there. Thank you for, uh, for doing such a great job uh, introducing yourself and some of the things that I wanted you to cover. Um, I'll, I'm going to hit you with a couple things right off the bat. First of all, I have a Tuesday, Thursday class. We recently talked about uh, presidential primaries, and Missouri changed its presidential primary in 2022, right, from a primary, regular primary, where we all go and vote behind our little thing, to something we haven't talked about in this class yet, which is a caucus system. Yes. Can you explain in a nutshell? What is a caucus, and what precipitated that change? Sure, I can do that. Um, so previously, we actually already had a caucus system in place and a primary system in place. The thought process, which I don't agree with, and I'll get to that in a minute, was because your the delegates that are awarded. So you know, when when your presidential primaries and caucuses are going on, each state awards a number of delegates to whoever wins. Um, and, and how Missouri has been um, in the past is they award their delegates based on the caucuses. 
not the presidential primaries. So we would have a primary, but it didn't really mean much because of how the delegates are actually awarded. So the thought process with that bill that passed last year was, well, the primary doesn't actually do anything. No delegates are awarded because of the primary. It's just costing the state millions and millions of dollars to run an election that actually doesn't mean anything other than it just kind of shows on paper where the general population is, but it's not actually awarding any delegates. The thought was, well, why are we doing that? Why are we spending state resources on an election that doesn't actually accomplish anything? So that was the thought process in removing the primary and just sticking with the caucus system since that's what was already in place and how the delegates were awarded. Um, there have been a number of bills this year though be, be, to try and bring the primary back but to make sure that delegates are also being awarded based on how the primary worked. And the caucuses are weird. So like the way they're structured is they're kind of closed door meetings with your, your mostly party kind of leadership with both the Democrat side and the Republican side. It's kind of your party insiders who all get together and have a fight about how they're gonna award the, the state's delegates. It's, it's not a super open process for the public. The public can attend. Like, you, you can go and participate in either the Republican or Democrat caucus, how, whichever one you identify with or affiliate with. But it's, it's, it's long. It's not, like one, it's not like you just walk into the, the ballot booth and you can vote and you're done in 10 or 15 minutes. It can be, like, it can be an all day thing or longer. Um, so that's, that's the caucus system. That was the thought process behind eliminating the primary, but there are some there is some legislation being considered this year to bring the primary back because it is more accessible to the public. You have more interesting results that probably better reflect where the state is as a whole, and that's where the things are on that. Um, you guys are working on several gigantic things right now, but uh, and, and students have questions about many of them except Nobody asked about corporate tax cuts. Probably right now the biggest thing uh, General Assembly is working on is, was it having corporate tax cuts, cutting them in half? Uh, what, what are you guys working on right there and what percentage yeah, is so, that? Yeah, so a couple weeks ago, the House passed out a, a very large tax cut that did a series of things. One, it continues to lower the personal income tax. Two, is it eliminates the Social Security tax that um, our Missouri seniors pay when they receive their Social Security checks. The state right now charges them a tax on their Social Security earnings, so it eliminates that. And then it also um, drops the corporate income tax down. And then after, there, after the immediate drop, it tries to phase it out over time, depending on what the state revenues look like. So the idea there is We've been on, the tr on a track for a while of lowering taxes in Missouri for a number of reasons. One, um, there, there's a lot of people in Jefferson City who think that you all know how to spend your money better than government does. Um, and because of that, we want you to have more money back in your own pockets. Two, there's a thought when you're looking around at what other states around the country are doing on that front, and Missouri is trying to stay competitive with especially the states that are growing um, rapidly in both population and economically. Uh, you see a lot of those states are bringing taxes down and, and, they're, being, and, and they're seeing good results. Economic growth is good. Um, you have more people coming into the state. And because of those things, while at the same time as tax rates are going down, revenue is going up because of more economic growth and more people in the state. So what we are trying to do is stay competitive with a lot of our neighboring states who have done things along those lines and are seeing uh, some good results from that. What has been interesting is we're now you know, five or six years into this track of reducing taxes over time. The way we've structured it is um, I think smart because it makes sure that we're only reducing the tax rates are only going down as long as state revenues are good. So that's one of the things that sets us apart from what 
Um, for example, everyone likes to talk about Kansas a few years ago, maybe a decade or so ago now. They dropped their uh, income tax rates significantly and had some pretty bad results where they ultimately had to raise taxes again, is my recollection. So in order to avoid that scenario, to make sure that we're doing it in a, in a prudent, fiscally responsible way, we've put triggers in place where you know, the, the tax rate will only drop if certain revenue metrics are accomplished. And what we've seen is even as we've been reducing our tax rates over the past five, six years or so, our revenues have been growing uh, a lot. So we have not gone off the fiscal cliff by any stretch. In fact, um, our, our revenues are at record levels. We have more money in the bank as a state than we've ever had. And our state budget has grown. Uh, it's almost doubled in the past decade. So um, depending on your political philosophy, that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but it's showing that our approach to tax cuts has been working and we're seeing good results as far as revenue and economic growth and uh, we're seeing decent population growth. It's not where we want it to be, but we're not losing population like Illinois and New York, for example. Uh, all right, let's get to uh, less nerdy stuff. Uh, we had a couple uh, students ask about a historic event going on right now in national politics. Uh, Jacob Sheffer from another class asks uh, your personal opinion if you'd like to share it on the legal issues facing former President Trump right now. You know, I haven't actually paid all that much attention to that. I've been more focused on Missouri and what I can do to um, help our, our state here in Missouri. So I, it's, it's kind of bad as a political nerd to not be as in tune with what's going on at the national level, but since there's not much I can accomplish at that level, I don't get into the weeds quite as much on what's going on federally. Uh, I would like to open it up to the floor for anybody in the room, but before we do, let me continue softening the ground with a couple more questions from six other classes that you're just unfortunately not gonna get a chance to visit with. Olivia Dishner has a question. She asks, um, sadly related to the, the shootings in Tennessee, uh, we had actually I had several students ask about that. What steps would you take to make schools safer for students, families, and faculty? Related to that, Emma Mayberry from a different class, similar question. You frequently vote yes on expanding gun rights with the rise of school shootings and gun violence. What is Missouri going to do to stop this? I appreciate that question. So one of the things that we've been working on for a few years now are, are trying to do things to make our schools more secure. So like give them more tools to make the buildings physically more secure. There's some interesting technology out there that we're looking at that as, as sad as it is, I think it's probably necessary to have certain like bulletproof safe style facilities in each classroom. Um, trying to work with our uh, local schools to figure out what they what they what they need to beef up their security and beef up the, the, the physical strength of their buildings to avoid that um, or, or to try and mitigate the, the, the risk there. And we've had some, some we, we've made some progress on that side over the past couple years and I think we'll be able to continue to do that um, with the budget going forward. Um, so the, that's been where our, our focus has, has mainly been, is trying to increase security. So but we'll talk about the gun control thing, because that's always, that's always interesting. Um, so I will admit, like, I, I don't have a whole bunch of guns. Not the biggest gun guy in the world. What I'm skeptical on with trying to impose gun control is we have 350 million or more guns floating around the country already. So I, what, I, what I don't understand is if you're just going to say we're going to ban a particular gun, what are you going to do with the 350 million or so guns that are already out there? Uh, if you're gonna stop, if you're gonna say, well, tomorrow we're gonna stop manufacturing a certain type of gun, that's fine, but you still have more guns than people. And we already have laws on the books that say you can't kill people, you can't go, you know, you can't go into schools and shoot up, shoot up a, a kindergarten class. So why do we think 
that the people are going to somehow say, well, you know, there's a, a law in the books that say that says I can't have a particular gun, that they're going to follow that law if they're already disregarding the laws that say you can't kill people. So if you could show me a way to completely eradicate guns, uh, maybe that's a conversation worth having. But I don't see any way that saying, well, we're going to say, you know, you can't have a certain type of gun, that that's going to that that's going to solve this problem because we have so many out there already. They're so accessible. Um, you know, it's 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 so, somewhat cliche, but you the re the reason bad guys are bad is because they're they're disobeying the law already. I don't know why saying imposing some new law that says you can't do one more thing is going to help. So that's where I'm at on that. But happy to have a, a discussion because that's always an interesting discussion. Um, I did not mark down what student asked this question. It's a really good one though, and it deals with one of the most important things working through. I believe just the Senate right now. At some point, you'll probably be asked to have an opinion. The Missouri State High School Activities Association currently has a policy in place for transgender student athletes, and it has been working, so says the student. Do you support Senator Rick Bratton's bill that allows individual districts to hold votes on whether to ban transgender athletes? I, I think what they mean is determine which gender sport they compete yeah. in. If so, please explain your reasoning. Yeah, you know, I think that is one approach that I'm not, I'm not inherently opposed to. So, um, in, in, in addition to some of the other things that we've talked about, one of my roles in the House is I'm the chair of the House General Laws Committee. So we are the committee that tends to get a lot of the bills dealing with your most high profile, controversial type of issues. So, as you all probably know, the way legislation moves through the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate is, you know, on the House side, any legislator can file a bill. The speaker then has the uh, power to refer a bill to a committee or to never refer a bill, and basically the bill would die if a bill doesn't get referred. So once the bill gets referred to committee, it's up to us as committee chairs to decide if we're going to hold a, a public hearing on the bill. That would be the next step. And then after the public hearing, there would be an opportunity to um, to vote the bill out of committee and, and send it further along in the legislative process where it could ultimately be debated on the, the House floor and passed out and then sent over to the Senate and then the whole process starts over again there. Um, one of the first bills that I received, it was actually the first hearing that I held as committee chair dealt with some of those types of issues that you're talking about. The other, the other one was dealing with um, transition procedures for minors. And my approach to that was I was not going to take just a partisan, you know, here's where Republicans are, here's where Democrats are on the issues. I wanted to hold a very robust hearing where everybody that wanted to testify on the issue could come and be heard, where the committee could start to form their own opinions, try and gather all the facts and data to come up with a well thought out position. So what we did is, is we, we had a hearing that started at, at 4.30 in the afternoon and ultimately got done about 1.45 the next, the next morning. It was a nine hour and 15 minute hearing Longest hearing in, uh, in Missouri House history, actually, outside of a budget hearing. And what we did is, is we allowed, I mean, there were a couple hundred people that ultimately had the opportunity to testify on both sides of those issues. So on the sports issue, you know, we heard from, from, from transgender kids who had thoughts on that. We heard from other people who um, had competed against transgender individuals and had some thoughts on, on how that impacted them. On the medical procedure side, we heard from some transgender kids who were going through some of those procedures. We heard from some kids who had undergone those procedures and had some, some serious concerns and, uh, and a lot of regret over what they had gone through. So what, what my approach, and then after that, 
Um, we, as, as a committee, did our own research also. We talked to uh, everybody that we could on the issue, medical providers, families, you name it. And ultimately, the committee um, did move both of those bills forward. One to deal with um, what they call the Saving Women's Sports Bill, where you basically the, say that um, from middle school through college, um, biological males would be limited to competing against biological males. And, and the same would be true for biological females. And then on the uh, medical procedures side, there was a lot of discussion over that one. But I don't know if you all have seen it, but there's been a number of um, investigations launched and whistleblower complaints come forward, especially with most of the procedures that are being done on those issues. It's one clinic in St. Louis. And there's been um, quite a bit of concern raised by both people who worked in that facility, as well as parents who have had kids undergo some treatment through that facility, but there's a great deal of misconduct and problematic things being done there. Um, so we as a committee moved those bills forward because it seemed to us that in light of everything going on, it would be wise to put a bit of a hold on that while these investigations are going forward, while additional whistleblowers are coming forward, and while the uh, medical providers are, are under investigation by multiple sources, the Attorney General has launched one, the, um, the, the actual clinic itself, or, or the governing body, the Washington University, has launched an investigation to figure out what is happening in that clinic. So for those reasons and others, and we could talk a long time about that, we decided to move those bills forward out of committee. They haven't been voted on um, in the House yet, We'll see what happens at that point. All right, I want to take a moment to open it up to anybody who might be in the room who might have thoughts, questions about anything related to what we talked about or anything else. Yeah. Um, this is more like just on my mind. Um, I understand that the Republican Party is more of government out of our, like what we do. Um, so on the trans issue, why are Republicans so concerned with trans issues? Because shouldn't that be left to them instead of government control? Like, shouldn't it be up to the schools and the parents? Yeah, so I, I think, I appreciate that question. I think that's a great question. Um, and it, for, for me, that's one of the things that's made this a, a very complicated issue. So as you all know, you know, the Republican Party is very split between numbers of factions. The Democrat Party is very split between different types of factions. And for me, I, I tend to be in the faction of the Republican Party that is more <coughs> limited government. We just want people to be left alone. The exception to that is if individuals are, are causing harm to others, or um, especially in the case of kids, if you think that kids are being harmed since they can't really do anything to protect themselves. So you may agree, you may disagree, but the theory 